We're back here again with Dr. John F. Martini. He's a human behavior specialist. We also have two of his students, and I myself am also a student. We have Lisa Kay. She's an entrepreneur from the Seattle area. And we have Colleen Marty, who is an entrepreneur. Welcome. Thank you for coming back for a second show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. So I wanted to touch back on to a point that you were starting to make before we ended the last show, where uh, helping parents or other people understand other people's values. And you were talking, giving an example about a young man in Australia. Well, actually, it was in Connecticut. Thank you. But I, was, I, was, I didn't quite finish that, but um, to shorten the story, this young boy was labeled by the teacher and the mother, the counselor, as learned disabled, unmotivated, low self-esteem, et cetera, et cetera. I went in a matter of minutes and I asked the child where he excelled, where he was interested, where he was inspired, and then asked him, because his focus was video games, uh, and people here in Hawaii will have children that are not like this, teenagers like this, that are inspired by video games or inspired by surfing or inspired by something that they're interested in. And the parents and the teachers will project onto them labels that that's not right and they're unmotivated to do the things the teachers want. And uh, what I did is in a matter of minutes I had the boy stand up in front of 200 people and show us and share with us what he knew about video ice hockey. And to everybody's surprise he had an amazing memory. He was sharp and I mean, sharp as a tack on remembering everything about the ice hockey players and about the video game. And then what I did is I asked him, what classes is he having difficulty in? And he says, well, math and this particular class. And I said, well, when you play video ice hockey, aren't you playing on a rink? Yeah. And isn't that a rectangle? Yeah. And isn't that a form of mathematics, geometry? Yeah. And aren't the corners of it semicircles? And isn't that a form of math? Yeah. And the net... Um, a crisscrossing of lines and squares and that geometry and that math, yeah. And isn't uh, you're moving the puck around and that's circular and that's mathematical and aren't they using it with an angled uh, puck uh, stick and, and isn't that a, uh, a mathematics? And I went through and showed him the relationship between mathematics from keeping scores to the numbers on the, sh on the, the uniforms to keeping records of what they've, the fouls they've done and the scores they've made and the goals. And I showed him the correlation between mathematics. And in 14 minutes, in front of 200 people, I showed the child the relationship between why studying mathematics would help him in video games. When I got through, he turned to his mother in front of all those people and said, Mom, can you get me a book on all this? Because I'd like to study this. So the teacher and the counselor and the mother that's sitting there um, were kind of like going, OK. But the son literally turned to the mother and asked, if he could study now the mathematics. Now they labeled him as got learning problems and he was having the most difficulty in mathematics until I could show him the correlation of how studying mathematics would help him fulfill what is important to him. Now I work with, I do a program called the Young Adults Inspired Destiny Program. And I work with young teens, oh, 15 to 22, this age group. And we start at eight in the morning, we go to six o'clock at night. And after six o'clock at night, the parents are supposed to pick up the kids and none of the kids want to leave. Because once you communicate in their values, they're, in, they're glued, they're inspired, they want to learn. So there's no such thing as a child that doesn't want to learn. And I haven't seen a child that has learning problems, really. I have, I have children that have con concentrated value systems, and teachers and parents and counselors and therapists aren't knowing how to relate to those, and they're not honoring those and communicating in those. So in the process of actually doing that, the children excel. And so if you're in Hawaii here and you've got young boy or girl and they're focused on socializing or focused on partying or focusing on that, they're developing skills that they're going to need. If you want them to learn a certain thing or get them to do something and accomplish something, the key is to find out what is important to them and their values by observing their life carefully, look at what their life demonstrates, and then communicating what you really would love to do in their values so they can get their values met doing it. If you can't communicate that, then you're going to be frustrated and project a label on them. But if you master the art of communicating that, you're going to actually show yourself how to learn to communicate and actually enhance their life and expand their life by now taking what they would love to do and diversifying it and including the things that they're going to need in, in the world. So there's an art to it, and it's teachable. And, and that's what I attempt to do in my programs and in my books to, to help people learn that art. Where, where can we learn that? 
which particular book, or how would we go you know, about learning more about that? Well, one of the books, I've got a new book that's coming out called Inspired Destiny. For, that's specifically for young adults. But there's another book called The Heart of Love, which helps people identify what specifically they can do to identify their values and their children's values, or their loved one's values. And then how to link their values and that person's values. Because if you can't see how what they're dedicated to serves your life, and you can't see what you're dedicated to serves their life, uh, you have nothing to communicate. You're going to have these alternating monologues where they're speaking, you're not listening, and then you're speaking, they're not listening. But in the heart of love, that chapter on how to communicate and link values can literally salvage relationships and, and keep the sanity back in a family dynamic. And we actually have a copy, John, and I think you can get that at some of the libraries here. So Yes, the, I believe so. The other question I wanted to ask you that we didn't quite get into in the earlier show is once someone awakens and realizes where their expertise or what they love to do, you had mentioned in one of your talks that a lot of times we don't acknowledge our vision. So what is the potentials? You know, what happens when someone is not really acknowledging their vision? When people aren't living congruently and aligned with their highest values and being authentic and genuine and inspired by what they're doing, um, they tend to subordinate to outside influences. Just like the young boy who may buy into, the, buy into the idea that he's got low self-esteem because he's expecting himself to be doing well in an area that's not inspiring to him. And the teachers and the parents and the counselors are all expecting that. And they just suppress the child further into a vicious label. Um, when a person is congruent with their highest values and starts to set goals that are that, or they link what they're having to do to those highest values so they're inspired by what they do, they come out of their shell, they start to shine, they allow themselves the belief, I can, I know, and I am. They awaken their leadership skills that are there waiting to surface. And they're more inspired and affirmative to life. And they feel that the universe is working on their behalf instead of against them. When they're working against them by not being congruent, they're more likely to be looking for a pleasure to overcome their pain and to be looking for addictive behavior. So a lot of the problems that the kids are having in school are simply because they are not knowing their values. The parents and the teachers aren't communicating in those values and knowing them. And the entire system is an authoritative projection instead of the art and mastery of communicating and honoring children and teens in their realities. There's a major difference that occurs, and I assure you that children can do extraordinary things, and they're here to do amazing things, just like we are as grown-up children, to do the same things with our lives. So we're here to be congruent. But I think a, a huge part of the responsibility does fall to the parents that that's part of our responsibility in choosing to have children is to educate ourselves on um, what's important to us and then, of course, teach our kids to value what's important to them. And so I think a lot of it starts from educating ourselves as opposed to just expecting kids to know this stuff. So the parents are the ones that need to read the books and learn how to determine what their own values are. And as soon as they can identify their own values, then they can start looking for it in their children and helping them identify their values and honor their, um, honor their own values. I have a, a great example. My son actually has dyslexia, and he's like in fifth grade. And he struggles with school, and it's not his favorite place to be, but I always try to help him see how that being in school is actually educating him for his future. And so um, he was struggling with one of his teachers and the way that she was treating other kids. And he came to me and, and kept asking me and you know questioning, I'm not liking going to school. I'm not liking my teacher. And um, finally, I... He, one day he refused to go to school and so I just got really clear and asked him specifically you know what is it about school you're not liking what are you uncomfortable with and it turned out he didn't like the way that his teacher was treating other kids and so then we got down to some more of the details and he talked about a specific situation that made him very uncomfortable and so then I think another one of our responsibilities as a parent is to be our child's advocate and so um, my son always commented that he, he believed that if the principal knew what was going on in his class, that it wouldn't be allowed. And so then we finally called the principal and um, scheduled a meeting to go in and talk to him. And my son was very uncomfortable doing this whole thing, but I talked him into participating in it. And then in the end, we actually pulled the whole thing together to show how um, he was actually being a child's advocate by standing up for the rights of the, the kids in the class. And soon as he saw that, then he saw his value in his role 
in the classroom, and so then he has a higher level of interest in being in class if he can help protect the other kids in the class that don't have um, as much support as he does. You never have to get or motivate a child to do something that's inspiring to them that's highest on their values. And to the degree that they can see that whatever they're going to do in their life, uh, in their school, in their play, in their duties at home, uh, if they can see how what they're doing is going to help them fulfill their highest value, they'll do it without having to be motivated and coerced. So the art of communicating what needs to be done as a teacher, as a parent, or people in society is the art of caring enough about another individual and knowing their values and communicating how what they want done can help them fulfill those values. We call it sales in the world of business, and we forget that that same art must be done on a daily basis in our people that we care about because you're really selling. You're really caring enough to know what their needs are and making sure you're offering something in those needs. And when you do, children do amazing things. They want to live. I, I'm absolutely certain that children want to learn. They're inspired to learn. They just want to learn things that they believe is going to be meaningful to their lives. We have the responsibility as parents and as teachers to find out what that is and then artfully communicate that, what we want to teach, in their value systems. And amazing things happen when you do. Truly amazing things. And even that, I mean, that's a great point because even if the teacher isn't inspired and as a parent you can't do anything to get the teacher to be inspired, you can actually educate your kid on what else can you get out of the class even if the teacher isn't doing it in an inspiring way. In South Africa, uh, we initiated a initiative on education and I had the opportunity to work with some people from colleges. I've got two of them coming up in just a couple weeks, in fact. Some colleges, some middle schools, and also some younger schools. And what we did is we actually had teachers, we had faculty members in the school, we had the principal in the school, we had some students in the school, we had them all there. And what we did is we took the principles that I mentioned in the heart of love, and we had everyone do a value determination process. And anybody here in Hawaii can do this. And it's a simple process. It's just simply asking what the questions are in there. Asking what specifically do I fill my space with my time and determining values and setting up a priority of values. Once we did that to the teacher and to the principal and to the students and to the counselors, we then said, all right, what's the curriculum? And we, we wrote down all the curriculum that they're having to teach. And then we asked the teachers, how is teaching that curriculum going to help you fulfill your values? Because if the teacher can't see how what they're teaching is going to fulfill their values, they're not inspired teaching. And nobody wants to go to a boring teaching. They want to go to an inspired teacher. So we would make them go through and answer that until they would get literally tears in their eyes for the opportunity to be able to teach something that was now fulfilling their values. Then we did is we then trained the teacher and created a chart in the class between all the different, every one of the students had a list of their highest values on a laminated sheet so the teacher knew what's important to the child and they had to communicate with that reminder in front of them and they were responsible to make sure when they're talking to that student that they think in terms of what's important to that child. Then they had to ask the child to ask how is studying this class going to help them in their, in their values. And once we made these links, not only did participation in class go up, not only did the grades go up, not only did the fun and the energy go up, but now the kids are now doing things, they're wanting to do it. It's not because they're having to, they're wanting to. When people do what they love and love what they do, they come alive. And when they feel like they've got to do something that goes against their values, they die. They well, really die. It's a different energy. And what I love about the method is even businesses can do this. So you can take a business that's teetering on extinction and bring up the level again to another inspired vision. Because a lot of times there was a vision there, and you talked about that. So what are some ways that within our social... You know, because as an adult, sometimes it, we're, we've gotten ourselves into paradigms. What are some ways that we can start to look at this as an adult and incorporate it in our daily lives? Well, how about starting with the kids? If you're a parent and we're still in kids and you have a child and you're listening to this and you're mm -hmm. thinking, okay, but my daughter, you know, is past the point where there's anywhere to go in school because maybe you feel a little bit hopeless. And what could what are her values, where her values could be just hanging out with her friends, maybe starting to smoke marijuana, or just kind of playing, and how can you change, if it's possible, mm -hmm. or link her values to something that we would think, you know, in normal society would be more, um, more beneficial to her. 
more accepted, accepted by society. Accepted yeah. As well. mm -hmm. Well, I say that uh, it really doesn't matter what the age group is, because whether you're 100 years old or whether you're just born, you have a set of values, you set of priorities. Again, we don't want to confuse values that are social idealisms and political idealisms and religious idealisms. They may or may not be a person's real values. So, so really what it would be, if you followed that person around for a week and watched them and listened to their conversations, would that show their values? It would, Absolutely. It would give an indication of what's important to them. Mm -hmm. what, value is what you value, what you think is important. And, and so to a teenager, one of the highest values they may have is being connected socially with people and feeling like they're the center of attention. So if that's their highest values and you're wanting them to do well in class, and if they go, well, how's that going to help me become the center of attention in school? They're not going to want to do that. But if you can actually ask yourself as a parent, how specifically is them being the center of attention serve me as a parent? How does it serve, because that may be a leadership skill in the future that they're going to want to develop. You want to find out how it serves you as a parent. Because if you can't see how what they're dedicated to serves you, you're going to want to fix them and change them. And they're going to fight you. But if you can see and honor them to know and find out how it serves you, you're, instead of wanting to fix them, you're now wanting to communicate with them. Now if you can then see how specifically is them taking these classes or going to work or doing what it is and being accountable. How's it going to help them in that? If you can see that, it's more easy to communicate that. But if you can't see it and you think they're wrong and you just coerce them and force them, you're just going to get resistance and in some cases violence and, and um, you know, they're going, to, they're going to stop you. Now this occurs in business between employees. This occurs between the customer and the employee. This becur becomes any level in a company. This is our social life. This is our spiritual life in the sense of people that we look up to in our spiritual quest. In any area of our life, everything boils down to human values and communication, and, and a fulfillment in life is based on that. So it's really applicable whether they're young or old, because you may actually be having a grandparent that's starting to lose some of their mental faculties, and you still got to find out what's important to them to communicate with them. So it doesn't matter the age, it doesn't matter the occupation or the stage of life. Understanding human behavior and understanding human values, which drive people, is an essential component to the art of communicating, which gives you the greatest options and opportunities in life. And I think a big part of that as well is honoring the fact that everybody has an opinion about what is important to them. So kids know what's important to them. 80-year-old grandmothers know what's important to them. Everybody knows what's important to them if you just honor the fact and respect them and, and give them the opportunity to tell you what's important to them as opposed to projecting your values of what's important to you onto them and expecting it to be important to them as well when it won't be. So true. I know for myself that uh, the communication is not always outward, it's also inward. When you are minimizing yourself, subordinating to outside influences and expecting yourself to be somebody you're not and try to please people all the time. So you're not acknowledging your own values. You're vision. not acknowledging your own values. Okay. And now you're expecting yourself to live outside your own values and the only thing you'll end up with is anger and aggression, blame and betrayal, criticism and challenge to yourself. And then you're going to end up going to a vicious cycle, minimizing yourself further to other people that you think have a better life, which you then get, you can lose yourself. And when you do, because you're not fulfilled, you're going to look for something to make you feel better, a dopamine fix. So addictive behavior is a lot more likely in those situations. But I am certain, I've done it thousands of times with clients and customers and people in my seminars, that if a person gets congruent with their own values, discovers what they are, sets goals that are congruent with it, their fulfillment goes up, and their likelihood for looking for immediate gratification and immediate uh, dopamine fixes calms. So it's a, it's a change in their whole vitality. So it actually can change their physical stress sure. and perception, and then that's when the inspiration is actually, you're more aligned with. What Lisa just said about everybody having clarity inside, I'm certain of that. I, I, I do that in the Breakthrough Experience every week, and people really do know what they would love to do. Well, why are they, people afraid to go? I was going to say they may not necessarily always feel comfortable speaking what they love to do because they feel like that it won't be acceptable to the person or the, the crowd that they're speaking to. And that's probably the most common thing. They know, and when they feel like that they're in a safe place or with somebody that really wants to know what they love to do, they'll open up and say it. But if they feel like they're going to be judged negatively for it, they'll shut down and they won't say a word. Particularly if they minimize themselves to them as an authority. Because when you are around people that you minimize and you don't really care about their opinion, you don't mind opening up. But if you're around somebody that you think their opinion is important and you want to please them and you're subordinating to them, you'll shut yourself down to try to fit in 
instead of be your own authentic self. And there's actually several areas we do that in. We Can do it in all areas of life. Can you explain a little bit about where people tend to, because it's not just in our physical life. What are the areas you tend to see? Well, I, I say that there's basically seven basic fears that immobilize people and keep people playing smaller. And whether that be a small uh, a young child or whether it be an adult, doesn't matter. It's the same principles are there. And that's basically people who subordinate to people who they think mo know more than them. See, you know a lot about you. You have your own PhD in you by the first four years of your life. You already know about you. And you know more about you than anybody else. And somebody could do a PhD program study on your life, and they could get a PhD on you, but you may not honor you, but you really have multiple PhDs in your life by the time you're mature. So if you're minimizing yourself to somebody that you think has more knowledge than you, you're going to play small and you're going to play fight. And the same thing with success in business. If you think somebody's more successful in business than you, you can withdraw yourself. Same thing with money. If you think they've got more wealth than you, you can minimize yourself. Or a better relationship. Or somebody that you're infatuated with and afraid of losing, you can play that too. Or you might be rejected by somebody that you've given power to. Or you might think somebody's more handsome or beautiful or more vital than you and withdraw. Or spiritually aware. So in any area of life, whether it be spiritual or mental or career or financial or family or social or physical, you can subordinate to people you've given power to, minimize yourself and lose your authenticity, and get into a vicious cycle and live in fear most of your life instead of inspiration in life. And I think getting, getting past the fears, my program, The Breakthrough Experience, that was the whole purpose of it, is to help people break through the fears so they can live an inspired life that's authentic. And Lisa, we've had a little bit of conversations. Can I ask you a little bit about the direction with you having three kids mm -hmm. with a little bit of disabilities, mm -hmm. how has that helped you to uh, discover what I want to do in life? Yes. Yeah. I think that everything that, every part of our life is part of our purpose and that it's all helping to wake us up to the awareness of what our mission and purpose is in life. And so um, as I went through the processes of my son being diagnosed with dyslexia and studying what dyslexia and learning disabilities were and discovering um, ADHD and that not only my daughter had characteristics of ADHD but I do as well and then um, ADD, um, I studied it a lot and I wanted to learn about it because I wanted to learn how to parent my kids properly because there isn't a whole lot of um, education out there about the, the true the truth of these um, learning disabilities because the, the truth is is that every kid with a learning disability also has a gift and so they, they come hand in hand you can't have one without the other and um, in schools we have gifted programs and then we've got special ed for kids with learning disabilities um, but kids aren't with learning disabilities typically aren't looked at as gifted kids that's not seen and facilitated and then the kids in the highly capable program there aren't programs available to help them with the areas where they have weaknesses and so um, because I've done so much studying on it it made me want to um, create a school that could facilitate that where you could have programs available that were where the teachers and the everybody was aware of the fact that these kids are gifted highly capable kids um, because I th think that there's a, a tremendous amount of potential there and like I was saying earlier about the people that go to prison so many of the kids that start out were that have ADHD have such a high capacity um, for a high energy level that they um, a lot of them end up in prison and if they were educated properly and that energy was channeled properly because they knew how they were different and unique in society that they wouldn't end up in prison and so I think it's a full cycle education process that if you educate the kids properly in the beginning and help them figure out what their values are and steer them in a direction where they're able to maximize what their gifts are and they're honored for that um, I spoke to a kid um, like 22 year old kid not too long ago who was actually in prison for crimes related to um, drug use and selling and after just speaking with him a few minutes I realized that one he was a br brilliant salesman and brilliant businessman um, and he had discovered that through the use of meth that he could then sell it and create a very lucrative lifestyle for himself 
and he couldn't figure out how to make the same amount of money doing anything that was legal. And so then, well, he found out something else that was illegal. He started buying or stealing cars and selling them, which was making him more money than the meth was. But what I talked to him about was that, um, that he was actually a, a highly skilled businessman and very intelligent and uh, and it was quite clear because even in prison he figured out how to sell things and how to make money and so we just talked about how he could actually channel that desire to sell things and to be business oriented into something that was legal and as soon as he saw that he went wow I've never even thought of it that way I just thought I was a bad kid that was doing bad illegal things I never thought of myself as a brilliant businessman and what a um, impact I could make well, we're almost out of time, so I wanted to ask, is there anything else that you folks would love to share with the community? Well, I would like to say that um, no matter what you're faced with, there's always a solution. And no matter what uh, challenge you have with your young'uns or your spouse or your friends or people at work or your clients, if they go back to the basics of human behavior and understand what drive people, um, and, and master the art of communicating in people's values and learning about that, I really believe that that will give them an advantage. And it's not that hard to do. It really, I mean, I've been blessed to be able to teach people in the breakthrough experience in a matter of minutes to hours how to start this process. Um, so if they would like to do that, I would encourage them to either get the Heart of Love book or books on value determinations and, and communication. It can make a difference of having a life that's inspired or a life that's desperate. And it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've gone through, if you learn those tools, you have an advantage in life. So that, I think that that's what I would like to share, that, that people have amazing capacities in there, it's time to let it out. And I think that everybody should be aware of the fact that regardless of your age, if you're very young or very old or somewhere in between, there's no such thing as a bad person. There may have been choices that we have made in our life that were um, some people would define as bad or that maybe were even illegal but regardless of what you've done it still doesn't make you a bad person you still have something to contribute to society and if you believe you have something to contribute then everybody around you will believe you have something to contribute okay well we really loved having all of you folks here and it's always an opportunity for me to see how in our everyday life we can have so much gratefulness for just each other and our own human potential, but yet acknowledging the other person. So thank you for coming. Colleen, any last comments? Um, I'd just like to put out the information about Dr. Demartini, www.drdemartini.com, for free video clips and um, to acquire any of the books for more information. Great. Well, thank you, folks, for joining us. I look forward to you coming back again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.